Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, you may be seated. <laughs> We're glad you're here tonight. You look like you're ready to have church and join the worship time. I'm glad my brother Phil is back with us to continue the message series he started. If you were not here last week, yes, we do have DVDs or CDs available. There's tape order forms on the back table at the back of the auditorium. You can place those in the offering set if you'd like to get one or order tonight's even. You can do that in the service. But uh, I don't want to take a lot of time just talking about stuff. I want Brother Phil to come and continue preaching to us. Amen. Y'all welcome Brother Phil back. Amen. Okay. Good to see you here tonight. Good to be in church. To be honest with you, I didn't always want to go to church. In fact, when I was pastor, I didn't want to go to church. <laughs> I dreaded Sunday mornings. But uh, when I get there, I'm just glad I went. And then after church, I'm even gladder I went. So I hope you leave here glad, no matter how you were when you got here, or what, how you felt when you were thinking about it. And Joe, thank you, Joe, for the invitation, church. Uh, I, I've never been, been real good at small talk. Uh, Joe's always been the personable one in our families. And, uh, you know, pastors always like Joe. They don't like me. I mean, not like they like Joe. He's smooth and, you know, a charmer and together. And I'm just, what you see is what you get. Not always very pleasant. But glad to be here. Now, our verse for the day, if you have your Bible, and I'm sure all of you brought your Bible because you love Jesus and you want to walk in the Word. And I know some of you may have just forgotten about it, but you would have had it. So if you have it, let's look in Hebrews chapter 4. I'm not going to be expositating on this verse tonight, but it does serve the purpose of laying a, a groundwork where you can get uh, some contrastual meaning out of it. Uh, based on what we talked about last week, I'm sure that everybody remembers everything I said. And so I'm going to play like that's really the truth, though I know it's not. And we'll uh, pick it up from there. I'm going to read here in just a moment. But uh, needless to say, we're talking about Islam. And there are significant differences between Jesus and Muhammad. Uh, Jesus is God. Muhammad was a man, a fallen sinner. Jesus gave moral standards. He gave a righteous standard for supersedes moral. He gave righteous standards, and those standards are here reflected in Hebrews 4.11. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. I used to think, what does that mean when I was, before I started preaching? And, you know, there's so much going on in the church today that is soulish. You know, it's emotional. You know how you get emotional at the country western music songs you like, or maybe pop songs, you get emotional. And that's what goes on most churches. Sunday morning, there's a lot of emotion, a lot of hype, a lot of whoopity doo da hey yay Jesus. A lot of that. But the Bible says the truth of God will penetrate through that hype to reveal where you really are. It separates those who soulishly follow, soulishly, emotionally follow Jesus, and those who really do follow Him, who spiritually walk with Him. And they that worship God must worship Him in spirit and truth because He is spirit. So there's a distinction about how you worship as a Christian. Soulish. Or spiritual. That one's free. Has nothing to do with what I'm preaching about. <laughs> Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrows and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now that's scary. A lot of people don't like to read the Word of God because they're afraid what it, what it will reveal about them. And the Bible says that the Word of God is like a mirror. James says, don't look in the mirror, which is what we do when we come to church and we hear the Word of God. Don't look in the mirror and forget what you see, but deal with it. So this standard is laid down throughout the Scriptures, which are infallible, inerrant, 
absolute, the final authority, the final word. Period. And as I said last week, it settles the question. It deals with the issue. It answers every question. And those who would argument with you, you can always take them to the Word if you know how to skillfully handle the Word of God. Muhammad's entire followership, the Islamic religion, is not like that. There was no standard and is no standard laid down in Islam, nor in the Quran. Vast dis- difference between Muhammad and Jesus. Jesus never commanded any of his apostles to go and loot caravans, destroy people. He never told any of them to go into the city and besiege it and kill everyone in there who's not like you. He never had villages decimated by his apostles. He never once told him to go in and kill men, rape women, and take women and add them to your harem so they'll be your sexual slaves. Never said take the children and sell them into slavery. All that was ordered by Muhammad. And I wish we had more time to deal with those specifics, but in a two-part series, it really deserves six, so there's just no way I can, I can do that. But if you were in a city that was besieged or set upon by the Muslim raiders, the Islamic raiders of that day and age, they, came, they took over, you had two choices. You could either convert and pay taxes, which were steep, or you could die. They would kill you. Islam is a bloody religion. Someone once wrote me after I preached that on television, and they said, you know, well, don't talk to me about the Muslims. The Catholics butchered millions of Muslims during the Middle Ages, the Crusades. They also, incidentally, butchered millions of Protestants and godly people and people who loved God with all their heart. They tortured them, quartered them, burned them at the stake. According to one scholar, about 50 million Christians were put to death during the Inquisition. Another glorious chapter in the history of the Catholics. But those Catholics who did that were not doing that under the command of God. Jesus did not command it. It was against everything the gospel stands for, everything the Bible teaches. But on the other hand, the Quran teaches, it commands you. In fact, it says, quote, go out and slay the unbelievers. Wherever you can find them, slay them. And it talked about how you were to crucify them, exterminate them. Execute them in every way and every cut off their right and cut off their left. Use your imagination. That was the commandment. And Jesus not one time forced anybody to convert. Muhammad was a bloody, bloody man. In fact, he was a not only was he a weirdo, he was a perverted man. When his son got married to this really nice looking girl, He went to his son and said, God told me, Allah told me, remember last week we talked about how Allah and God are not the same. Don't ever be tricked into believing that. It's not true. Allah was part of the hierarchy of the pantheon of gods among the early Muslim people, the people of that part of the world. He was not God, never was referred to as God, never shall be. Though they'd like to convince you that their God, Allah, is the same as your God. And their Muhammad is the same as your Jesus. Not so. This Muhammad went to his son and said, I want your daughter. I'll take her. I like her. But Father, I, that's my, I, just, I, just, I just married her. I just want her. Just took her. Just took her as my wife. And, I, and Muhammad said, no. Allah told me to take her. And she's mine, and there's nothing you can say or do about it. It's, it's settled. And so it was. 
Another thing, Jesus was never, and I don't even feel comfortable saying this, but I shall say it, Jesus was never sexually involved with little children. There was a girl, eight years old. Her name was Aisha. She was playing with her dolls one day and her friends. And Muhammad came by, took her to her parents and said, from now on, this, this little girl is my wife. And he married her from henceforth, among many others, called Aisha his wife. He's a wicked man. Now there's some differences too between, we talked about, about the Bible and the difference between the Koran. The Koran is made up of about 144 surahs, which means revelations. And they are arranged in such a way that it doesn't, according to size, not according to the dates they were written or when they were written or chronologically ordered. So it makes it a very confusing read if you're able to even really put it together. Bible's different. Bible is chronological. In other words, it has a beginning, it has an end, it has a, a middle. It was written out according to the dictates of the Spirit of God by men of God, men of old. The Koran, Muslim, many Muslims tell you the Koran was written in heaven. It was written, and no human instrumentality at all was used. Allah, God, just wrote it down for us. But when the Bible talks about Isaiah, it says Isaiah wrote Isaiah. Matthew Mark wrote, 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 wrote Matthew. John wrote John. Paul wrote the Pauline letters. It identifies the human who was used by the Holy Spirit, who dictated through them the words of God and the truths of God that he wanted laid out. You read the Koran, it is a jumbled mess. There are more grammatical problems in that book than, than, than you can imagine. In theologians of that persuasion, Islamic theologians and scholars says, well, you really need to read it in the original language, Arabic. But it still is full of grammatic problems. All kinds of historical errors, errors like we talked about last week, it's replete with them. The Koran was not divinely ordained, written, translated, inspired, it came from man. And as originally, originally, by the way, it was written piecemeal. They would be, see, and incidentally, Muhammad didn't write all the Bible. He did write some of it, or all the Koran, excuse me. But they would sit around, many of his elders and imams and teachers, they'd be around the fire, and all of a sudden, one of them would get a revelation and say something, and the other one would say, you know, that, that's, that's, that's Allah, that's God. Write that down. They'd buy, find an old piece of bone, piece of bark, they didn't have pencil on paper, a piece of papyrus, and they would write down everything that they, 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 that they had the revelation of, and then they'd stick it in the book. And incidentally, it was all written after, after Muhammad died. Now eventually, after that, and again, I don't have time to really get into this like I'd like to because it deserves some time to mill around in it, but eventually everyone in the Muslim faith, especially the leadership, began to argue over the validity of who had the authority. Did the descendants of Muhammad retain the authority to say what their Quran says? Who had the right to interpret what it said? Would it be the Amans, the Caliph? Who gets the chance to say, this is what it means? And eventually it caused a great civil war within that group, and you had the division between the Shias and the, and the Sunnis, and then you've even got breakdowns of that. But my point is, understand there is a deep and serious conflict between the Bible and the Quran. And there's a great effort today to bring us into a, a kind of gray area that makes makes you want to believe that the Koran and the Bible are on equal footage. They're not. They stand not together. No more than Muhammad and Jesus are equal in quality and truth. One of the books is based on lies. The other one on truth. One of them is based on love. 
One of them's based on hate. It doesn't take long reading them before you find out just which one is which. And ancient Islam is not very much different from contemporary Islam. They're both, they're both diabol diabolical, they're, they're, they're dangerous, they're insipid, they are aggressive, and they're spreading like wildfire all over the United States and all over Europe, and around the world. In Europe and in Canada, people are being sued, drug into court for telling the truth about Islam. It's illegal to speak ill of those. Let me give you a little quote. This is from a politician. Actually, he's a member of parliament in Holland. And he was given a speech here not too many long ago. In fact, it was just this month. And he said this, quote, I too have been dragged to court. I'm an elected member of the House of Parliament in the Netherlands. I am currently in court like a common criminal for saying that Islam is a dangerous totalitarian ideology rather than a religion. The court case is still pending, but I risk a jail sentence of 16 months for speaking up. Last week, my good friend Lars Hedglord, a journalist from Denmark, was fined because in a private, private conversation, which was recorded without his knowledge, he had criticized the way women are treated in Islamic societies. Recently, another friend of mine, Elizabeth Wolf, a human rights activist from Austria, was fined because she criticized Islam's founder, Muhammad. She had said that Muhammad was a pedophile because he had married a six-year-old girl and raped her when she was nine. Unfortunately, there are many, many similar cases. Unquote. So this is something that is coming. It's already rampant in our own country. You must understand that these things that I tell you are things that I tell you and your pastor wants you to know so that you can be prepared for what is coming. Now when Islam goes into a society or a culture or a country, they go in for the purpose of converting that. Unlike Christians, there's nobody within the Muslim faith that's just static. There are no sitters. There are no observers. They're involved. They are active. The Muslims have two basic efforts, fronts, of which they use to convert nations and cultures. One of them is a sword. If you go to Saudi Arabia, they have a flag, and you may have seen it before. You don't have to go to Saudi Arabia, but their Saudi Arabian flag has a big sword on it. And American boys who went over there to defend them against Saddam Hussein during the Gulf Wars in the 90s, those boys who bled and died protecting them were banned from bringing their Bible or a cross with them. Christianity is banned. You can't wear your cross. You can't wear any kind of instrumentality. You can't carry your Bible. It's banned. Christian evangelists and people who witness for Christ are executed. Churches are banned. You can't even have a secret church. They find out they're so afraid over there. Just like the ones who used to call me and say, I would give my life to Christ, but I know if I do, I'm going to be killed. And some of them go ahead and do it anyway and are killed. But without the sword of the state and the sword or the authority backed up by the courts of their, their countries, there would be no way that that could be enforced. Where Christians are killed and held in silence. And millions and millions of Muslims have died under this tyrannic terrorism. In fact, more people have been killed by Islamic terrorists in the Muslim world than anywhere else in the world. The second method of taking over a culture is through immigration. Mohammed taught his followers way back then how to go into a country or to a culture through immigration, taking people in there, and how they could take over a society. It's amazing how the devil and the cults use Christian methods 
but they don't have the Christian message. And the church who has the message rarely use the methods called living for Christ, called sharing your faith, called witnessing to others, called bringing people to church. Mohammed trained his converts to go in and be conversionist. And this effort, this, this, this tactic is called al hijira It simply means they go in. And for the last 30 years, Europe, as well as the United States, have been the focus of this technique. And for the last 30 years, especially Europe, has been radically changed. If you went there 20 years ago and watched the cities, the character of those cities, the profile of those cities are totally, totally different than they were then. One Italian official who's a well-known author over there said this. Her name was Oriana Falassi. And she wrote, in Europe, European cities, there is a second city, a state within a state, a government within a government. And that government is Muslim and it's run by Sharia law and it's run by the Quran. Another quick quote by a European leader, different one, says this, on why Islam is spreading so fast. Listen to this, very quick. Cultural relativism advocates that all cultures are equal. However, cultures wither away and die if people no longer believe that its values are better than those of another culture. Islam is spreading like wildfire Wherever people like the, lack the guts to say their values are better than Islamic values. Islam is spreading like wildfire because the Quran explicitly tells Muslims that they are the best of the peoples everywhere in mankind. And that non-Muslims, that's you and me, and that non-Muslims are the worst creatures ever put on the face of the earth. Islam is spreading like wildfire everywhere in the West where political, academic, cultural, media elites lack the guts to proudly proclaim, as I believe we all should, that our Judeo-Christian Western culture is far better and far superior to the Islamic culture. And we must be proud enough to say so. Now, so I won't get a letter about this. I have nothing against, I have no problem with Muslims. But I do have a problem with the totalitarian Islamic ideology that is filled with violence and hate and controls people's lives unto death. You say, would you believe moderate Muslims exist? Yes, they do, but moderate Islam does not exist. It cannot exist and stay true to the Quranic roots and foundation. It will be a violent religion. And that it is. They demand that the rules be enforced. And it's called, the, the, the system is called Sharia, which many of you know about. The way that it alone treats women is enough to disgust a normal person, much less a, a Christian person, Women are nothing but chattel in Islamic countries to be used and abused as one sees fit. The man they wear a burqa, it's demanded they wear headscarves in certain cases, the younger ones. It okays polygamy. A man can go out and have as many wives as he wants. A wife has no choice in that matter. A wife cannot divorce her husband. A a man can divorce her husband, his wife, very easily. The Sharia law calls for female genital mutilation. It calls for honor killings where a man can take his wife or his sister or his daughter and kill them simply for being impressed that they are not really following the regulations of the law of the Quran. And it's become a real problem in the United States, in our courts. And you know, the real thing, this, the thing is, it's really strange to me and just beats me to death is this idea that 
We can go to, and we have been to some of those Islamic countries, and you walk down the streets and you, you fear for your life. And the only place in the Middle East where a Christian can feel safe is Israel. Little tiny Israel with six million Jews. More Jews in New York City than are in Israel. Surrounded a little tiny piece of land by 450 million Muslims. And 23 countries. And yet tonight, all over the Islamic world, they want to squash Israel. Run it, murder all those Jews. They aren't after a Palestinian homeland, they're after the destruction of the state of Israel. And we have a president and his administration who has taken the, the only democracy in the Middle East and a dear ally to the United States and a president who has taken a position against Israel and has sided with the Muslim states trying to get Israel to withdraw, withdraw to a tiny little area that is indefensible. Their borders would be crossed easily. You could shoot a bullet across what they want Israel to pull back to. That's another sermon. But I have one last quote here from Greer Wilder. He is the Dutch parliamentarian. And what he says is so important because he's one of the leading voices in Europe. And he said this, Today we are confronted with political unrest in Arab countries. The Arab peoples long for freedom. However, the ideology and culture of Islam is so deeply entrenched in these countries that real freedom is simply impossible as long as Islam remains dominant. Further, he says, in a recent poll in post-revolution Egypt, you know, they've been going through all these running out the leaders over there. Devils they are, indeed. Someone in the, the Israelis say, the better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. But these revolutions are being instigated and provoked and promoted by the Muslim Brotherhood, which are the Wahhabists, if you would, of the entire Islamic world, the most radical of the bunch. And they're doing it on the pretense of bring the people liberty, bring them independence. That's not in the quote. This is a recent poll in post-revolution Egypt found that 85% of the Egyptians are convinced that Islam's influence on politics is good. 82% of them believe that adulterers should be stoned. 84% want the death penalty for apostates. That's you who believe in Christ, or if you're Jewish, if you're anything that they're not. The press refers to the events in the Arab world today as the Arab Spring. He says, I call it the Arab Winter. Islam and freedom, Islam and democracy are not compatible. They cannot exist together. He says, the death of Osama bin Laden last week, the week before last, was a victory for the free world. But we are confronted with Islamic terrorism as long as Islam exists. Because Islam's founder, Muhammad himself, was a terrorist worse than bin Laden. And here's another truth. The rise of Islam means the rise of Sharia law in our judicial systems in America. And now in, in Europe and now in America, we already have Sharia wills. Sharia schools, Sharia banks. Britain even has Sharia courts. It's never been as important as it is right now for Christians, especially in this country, to be aware of what's going on, to see what's happening to their nation and to their culture. to know what the Word of God says about it. You can't defend yourself against these based on the knowledge that you have tonight unless you have been studying and doing your homework, and most have not. Your Bible is nothing more than a leather accessory that you carry to church sometimes and usually sits on top of the television most of the time. It's not a book that you're having a love affair with. It's not one that you give yourself to. It's not one that you look at day after day. 
that you look, you study to show who you are in Christ. To show you that you are more than a conqueror through him that loved us. To show you who he is and who he is in you. Not who he is up there in heaven, but who he is living through us. God walks on the pages of this book. You want to meet God? You want to know God? Spend time with God. You don't get to know anybody unless you spend time with them. I might know about you. I might know about a political candidate. But until I sit time down, spend time with them, pick their mind, see what they believe, really, what motivates them, what occupies them, what's most important to them, where they put their money, that's where you really tell where somebody is, isn't it? Well, I love the Lord. You go home tonight and check your checkbook. That will tell you what you love. Boy, that didn't get an amen. That's the truth. God has given us the word. It's not just poetry. It's not just nice prose. It is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And as a discerner, it tells you what you are so that you can deal with it. And then, after it cleans you up and changes you from within, not from quitting this and quitting that. You know, so many Christians are all caught up in the same thing the Muslims are caught up in. Works! Work harder! Try harder. Quit more sin. That's not what Christianity is. It's not quitting smoking and cussing and chewing and going with the girls that are doing. It's discovering Jesus and his glory. And in discovering that, you see how worthless and filthy you are and I are. The more you see that, the more you want to see that. And the more you love him, the more you want to love him. Well, Phil, how do I get victory in my life? Love Jesus. Fall in love with him. And learn how to use the word. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not bullets and guns, like a bunch of survivalists out there. Christians are not squatted down in this world, waiting for the rapture and hoping to get out of here because the tribulation's coming and the economy's going to fall. We are occupiers. We are conquerors. We are to be assaulting the world, not hiding behind our gates, hoping that it doesn't assault us too much. That's the call of the Christian. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know what's wrong with us? We get these strongholds, but from the time we're little... We get these strongholds. Strongholds means way of thinking. We do what we do because that's the way we think. Out of the abundance of a man's heart, so he speaks, so he lives. So those fortresses of ways of thinking, those strongholds must be assaulted, allowed by the Word of God to come against those in your life. And the Bible says... The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down of ways of thinking, wrong ways of thinking, strongholds. And it will cast down imaginations. We're a culture in in big trouble today because of the imagination of man's heart. What goes on in the mind is so perverted in most that it defies description. The pornography that is bathing this land. Television is just filth after filth after layer of filth. And the imagination that is born through all of that, well, maybe I could have an affair. It looks fun. Maybe I should go out and fornicate. Looks good. Nothing's happening to them. Yet. The Bible says, because God's judgment 
is not speedily executed against those who do sin, then men's hearts are fully set to sin. Just because a hammer didn't fall today doesn't mean you're getting away with anything, especially if you're saved. God is not happy with the things in our life that dishonor Him, discredit Him, rebuke Him out of our lives. The Holy Spirit is so sensitive, folks. He is not tolerant. And if you don't want him in those areas of your life, he just retreats. Till you get chastened enough and repentant enough to do something about it. And then he gently moves back in. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty to the God, the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and everything that raises itself in our life against the knowing, the knowledge of God. When you're right with God and the Word of God is bubbling up through your life, you recognize immediately when so you come up against something that says, this is not something you need in your mind. Elijah said, I have set a guard about my heart, the portals of my mind, my eyes, my ears. I stop anything that invades that displeases or quenches or grieves the Spirit of God. That's what it means to allow the Word of God to have His way. It says bringing every thought into captivity. That's what a Christian filled with the Spirit does, and that's why they stay filled with the Spirit. They are in war every day. And they know it. He said, well, I don't, I don't want to go to what Someone tell me the other day, I just, why didn't God just zap me and make it, make it possible for me just not to have, have all these problems? Because you never learn, you never grow, you never discover the glory unless you're willing to wade through the gory. You'll never have victory unless you're willing to go to battle and wage war and take the kingdom of God violently. God gives you the weapons. Ephesians 6 gives you the ingredients. Go home, read Ephesians 6 tonight, and then stand, therefore. And having stand, stand! Amen. Well, I don't know if I can go to church on Wednesday nights or Sunday nights and Sunday morning too. And just... You will never have victory in your life until you avail yourself to the opportunities that you have to fill your mind with the truth and the Word of God instead of sitting on some sloppy couch or in your bed watching garbage on television of Survivor. The real question is, how many of you will be left as survivors? Wouldn't worry about Fantasy Island survivors, whatever they're on. <laughs> Discover the glory of the word. You know, only in the last two, when I quit pastoring and I had time to settle down between sermons, not preach three and four a day and run 15 ministries, I had time to hear God. Now, some pastors can do all that stuff and still hear God, but I'm not that spiritual. And when you start going to the Bible just to get a sermon, you're in trouble. Now I go to the Bible to get a word from God. Oh, I got them then, but I'm telling you that it missed something when you lose the capacity to spend time with God. Learn it, know it, and then learn how to wield the weapons, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I close. If you're here tonight and you want to have an Islamic experience and you want to know if you're going to heaven... I'll tell you very quickly. You must submit to the Quranic regulations and rules. You must submit to the caliph. You must submit to the, to the, to the, to the regulations that are laid out by the imams. And we don't even have time to begin to share some of those. Or about the Mahdi, the Messiah that is coming to rescue you. But when you read it, it reads a whole lot like the Antichrist. We don't have to cover some time to cover that, but we do have time to tell you that if you want to go to paradise, it's simple. 
Just go kill a Christian. Kill a Jew. Martyrs are promised heaven. But even they don't get in without the grand test. You know what the grand test is? If you're a Muslim and you've obeyed the Quranic law all your life, all you have to do is go on judgment day to the, uh, the Temple Mount in Israel, which they claim is theirs, it's not. And on top of the Temple Mount, there is a mosque called the Dome of the Rock. About a mile, mile and a half across something called the Kidron Valley, there is another mountain called the Mountain of Olives. And they say, or were told by the Islamic folks, that in the final day, Muhammad will take a horse hair and stretch it from one minaret on the Dome of the Rock to the one on top of the Mount of Olives. I don't know where they're going to get a hair that long. must be some horse. But he's going to take a horse hair and he's going to tie it from one to the other. And if you can get on top of that horse hair and tight rope walk it across the Kidron Valley, you get to go to paradise. If not, you're in trouble. If you're here tonight and you want to become a Christian... You know you're a phony, you know you're fake, you know you're a good church member, you walked out, you've said prayers, you got wet. And I'm here to tell you that all you have to do, according to the Word of God, is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Let's bow. Father, we thank you tonight for your word.